Hello, in this video regarding playing card ciphers, I want to talk about keying the deck as it relates to shuffling. The key of a playing card cipher is the order of the cards in the deck. If I want to choose that deck order via shuffling, it's important to understand how many times I shuffle the deck uh, in order to maximize the entropy within that deck. Shannon entropy is a way to quantify randomness in a sequence or in a set of data. So here we're going to look at that. Here I've got my deck and I have them in bridge order, which means that I have the deck in order by suits. So clubs first, followed by diamonds, followed by hearts, and then followed by spades. If I were to assign a numerical value to each card in the deck using this bridge order, aces would be low, so the clubs would be their face value of 1 through 13. This means then that the diamonds would be their face value plus 13, so the ace of diamonds would be 14 through the king of diamonds, which would be 26. Hearts would then be their face value plus 26, so the ace of hearts would be 27 through the king of hearts is 39, which finally means that the spades would be their face value plus 39. So the ace of spades would be 40 through the king of spades, which would be 52. Thus, every card in the deck has its unique value assigned to it. After shuffling, I want to see how random the deck is. How random is the sequence of cards in the deck? When we talk about randomness, we talk about equiprobability, in that uh, a card has the just as probable of chance of showing up at one position in the deck as it does at any other position in the deck. Okay, And so uh, let's talk about that. So in order to quantify this, we can do that by taking the difference of adjacent face values. So for every position in the 52 positions in the deck, I would take the first position and take its difference uh, with the next position in the deck. And I would do this modular 52. For those who are not familiar with modular arithmetic, modular arithmetic is the way to reset your counting after a specific point. Uh, it's Clock math is a common example. We have 12 values on a clock face, on a standard clock face. So when I start my day at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., <clears throat> and work my way around the clock face, as soon as I hit 12, I reset back to 1, don't I? So instead of saying 13, 14, 15, 16, as I would in a 24-hour clock, on a 12 clock, I now say it's 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., and work my way back around to midnight, of which point I reset the counter again and go back to 1. So modular arithmetic is just a way to reset your counting after a maximum value. So for our cards, our maximum value is 52. So I'm going to take the difference of two adjacent cards and then bring them back into the range of values of 1 through 52. And this will be done just by adding 52 to that value if it's a negative value. So let's go ahead and shuffle the deck a few times and see how this works in practice. Okay, I shuffled the deck four times. And so to quantify the entropy in the deck, I'm going to look at two adjacent face values. So we'll start with, in this case, the first value and the second. Here I have 10 of clubs, which has the numerical value of 10, and the ace of diamonds, which we assigned as 14. Remember, diamonds is their face value plus 13. So 10 minus 14 is a negative 4. 
negative 4 is outside of the range I'm looking for. I want to keep it positive. So I'm going to add 52 to minus 4. And that will give me a positive 48. So I would write down 48 and then move to the next two adjacent cards. In this case, I have 14 minus 44. Remember, the spades were uh, their face value plus 39. So 14 minus 44 is a negative 30. We're outside of that range, so I'll add 52 to bring it into the positive spectrum. So minus 30 plus 52 is a positive 22, so I'd write down 22 as my second number. And I would continue doing this throughout the deck until I get to the last two cards. I would record the difference of the seven of diamonds, which is 20, minus the six of hearts, which is 30. 20 minus 30 is a negative 10. Negative 10 plus 52 is a positive 42. But now I don't have an adjacent card for the six of hearts, do I? I would come back, this is a special case, wrap around the deck and take the difference of the last card with the top card, mod 52. So in this case, I would have 30 minus 10 is 20. I would write down 20 and I would be finished. <clears throat> so at this point, I have 52 recorded values, right? And each of them are going to have a value of 1 through 51. I think it makes sense that I'm not going to have a value of zero because no two cards are identical. And I'm not gonna have a value of 52 because there is no card assignment of 53. So I'll have all numerical values, recorded values of one through 51, but I'll have 52 of them. I'm going to count the frequencies of these differences. So in this case, 10 minus 14 was a negative 4, plus 52 is 48. How many 48s showed up in my recorded values? I would count all those 48s as a frequency. Maybe three 48s showed up, so I would write down three. right? And I would look at all the rest of the differences and count how many times that difference shows up in my recorded values. <clears throat> And then I will normalize that by dividing it by 52. Each of those would have an equal chance of showing up. So we'll go ahead and normalize it <clears throat> by taking its recorded frequency divided by 52. These are gonna give me a histogram of P values. I then wanna calculate the Shannon entropy of my deck. And this is by summing all 51 possible recorded buckets, right? All 51 P values, some of them will be zero. And I will take the negative p-value times the natural log of that p-value. This is defined as Shannon entropy. Uh, and I will see something like this. So this is showing me after zero shuffles, of course I have zero entropy. But as I work my way through one shuffle, two, three, four, five, and I work my way up to the top, we can see this graph uh, begin to emerge. Notice that after 10 iterations or so, maybe 9, 10, 11, around this area, my entropy doesn't really seem to grow anymore after this point. We'll notice some sharp increases up to that point, but after about 10 to 12, the amount of work of doing extra shuffles isn't getting me any additional entropy. I seem to be maxing out after about 10 to 12 shuffles. So to come back to our question then, how many times should you shuffle the deck when you're going to use that shuffle as a key? The answer should be around 10 to 12, okay? Now, I only shuffled these four times, so I could expect roughly about a value of two information entropy uh, in my deck. We could do better. We could get up to about, looks like three and a third. So I would just need to do maybe about five more shuffles, six more shuffles, and I could be up in this range of my entropy values. Uh, I will post a link in the description to where this comes from. This is an answer on Stack Exchange where someone asks about uh, the probability of cards showing up in specific locations on a shuffle. He went a little bit further and showed what 
deck orders look like after those 20 shuffles. So we can see uh, my start order if I'm assigning my cards 1 through 52 and their position in the deck of 1 through 52. So card 1 is in position 1, card 10 is in position 10, and so forth. Right? And as I begin to shuffle, there is uh, first shuffle, second shuffle. Um, it's interesting, he should have started with his uh, shuffle iteration as zero here. This is my first shuffle, my second shuffle, my third shuffle. I guess you could call this the second order of the deck. Uh, regardless, we can see you know, these biases. The biases still exist in four, although a little bit harder to see. And they exist in five where the angle now seems to be coming out here to the left. It's a little bit sharper on the six. We've come back here to the seven, so we can continue to see these biases. But after about eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 shuffles, uh, those biases are no longer apparent. We can no longer see them in the deck. And we can see that the start order uh, with its position in the deck is now becoming just as equally likely uh, as any other position. So visually, this is what we can see, expect to see with our deck orders. All right, so hopefully that answers your question. When keying your deck for your playing card cipher, uh, using what's called a riffle shuffle, you should do it roughly about 10 to 12 times to maximize the entropy or maximize the randomness in the deck. Additional shuffles past 12, as we shown, have shown here, uh, don't really get us any additional entropy, and so you're just putting in extra work for uh, no real benefits. All right, so thanks for watching, uh, and have a good day.